Okay, hi. Um, welcome to another chat. We're really delighted to have Ajit here. Ajit is the CEO and inventor of Avaz app, which is an AAC app aimed at helping people with autism communicate. Um, and he's, I've watched your Ched, TED talk. Um, it's got about a gazillion views. Um, really popular, really interesting. Um, really pleased to have you here. And I'd like to thank Deborah for extending the, the invite to you. Um, very excited about this because this is an area that um, actually we were discussing as part of the work we were doing with the W3C Cognitive Accessibility Task Force. Um, how do we um, deal with people that are nonverbal? Um, how do we make the web a more uh, friendly place? How do we enable communication, etc.? So, um, very interested in the work you're doing, very interested in, in the, the stuff, particularly around grammar and the complexities, because I've, I've been aware of things like deck talk and, and a lot of the symbol dictionaries for a long time, but some of the stuff that you were describing in deck talk seemed uh, a bit more complex, um, and uh, very interested in that. And I'm also really interested to talk a bit more about the cultural differences uh, between how you address disability, accessibility, the deployment of assistive tech between, say, India and, and the US, and, and also if you've any experience of working with, with Europe as well. So thank you very much for, for a great talk with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Neil. Thank you for having me, Deborah. Uh, it's a pleasure talking to you guys, and I'm, I'm looking forward to at least saying a few interesting things um, over the course of today's conversation. So, uh, thank you. Uh, I think for those for those of, of our viewers who missed it, uh, perhaps I should make it clear that I, I I am from India. I live in India. I live in the southern Indian city of Chennai, and that's where I'm skyping in from for, for the uh, chat today. So, uh, with that, yeah. Uh, what do you want? Do you want me to? Do you want me to talk a little bit about myself? How do you want to start? Yeah, we'd love. We'd love to know a bit about your background. So, can you tell us about um, how you to get involved in in developing AT? What was it that triggered your interest? Sure. Um, I'm an electrical engineer by training, so I'm not from the disability world uh, from my education perspective. Um, and as an electrical engineer, I used to live and work in the Bay Area, in the Silicon Valley in America for many years. Um, in um, 2007, that was eight years ago, I decided to move back to India. I, I, I got bitten by the entrepreneurial bug and I came back to India to start my own company, which I did. And at that point of time, I had no idea that I was going to get into disability. All I wanted to do was invent something new, um, hopefully something with a social dimension to it. Uh, but what happened was that when I moved back to India, a friend of mine introduced me to a lady who runs a school for children with special needs in, in Chennai, in the city that I'm from. And this school primarily works with children with cerebral palsy, um, but also autism, mental retardation, Down syndrome. Uh, so a group of mental disabilities in some sense, um, autism. So she enlightened me really uh, it was an enlightenment I, I found out about this 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 problem of children about why children with nonverbal disabilities disabilities that make them nonverbal um, they require various kinds of technology to help them uh, express themselves and to be communicative and, and to, to, to achieve inclusion um, the problem is that it, at that time in India there wasn't a single device that was available in this market. There were devices available in America. You know, the, the, these were available in several other countries as well. But in all of my time in India since then, I haven't seen a single one of those devices, which are often very expensive. I haven't seen a single one of them in India. So we had this incredibly large population. That there are estimates that India has the largest population of people with disabilities in the world. And we have this incredibly large population of people that have no technology whatsoever. And it was a very compelling proposition to me. And, and this friend of mine, this, this lady who runs this special school, uh, she pretty much uh, shanghai me into this world. She said, um, you're an electrical engineer, you want to do something cool. Now you need to make this for us. You need to make this for our kids. 
So I worked with her over a period of three years, I think, two and a half years. And like I said, it was, it was an enlightenment for me. Every step of the way I was, you know, there were myths being dispelled in my head. I, I developed a certain expertise in, in disability um, over the course of that time. I, I, I learned how hard it was to create assistive technology. And um, in 2010, we'd created this product, Abaz. Um, it was a tablet, it was a, it was a device and that we'd built ourselves. And it was the first um, AAC device in India. And uh, it was incredibly well received, um, very popular in India. We won an award from the president of India for, for inventing Abaz. And um, the iPad came out shortly thereafter. And so we converted the functionality of Abaz into an app. And then it really took off because people all over the world started using it. And that's how I got into the world of disability. Right. Excellent. I know Antonio has got a question. Yes, that's, uh, the way how, how everything started, it, it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting. You and just uh, look, there was an opportunity and you end up grabbing it with passion. Uh, I'm c uh, curious to know uh, about the people that we have working with you, what type of backgrounds they have, uh, experiences, how you put all that mixed together to, to achieve a result? Uh, um, my, my team has a combination of primarily two kinds of people. Um, one are the engineers, the technologists. I think I'm, I'm fortunate that um, I work very closely with um, uh, one the best technology uh, university in India. It's called the Indian Institute of Technology in, in, in Chennai. And so I have a lot of really excellent technology collaborators. The other dimension comes from the special education space, primarily speech therapists, because they're the ones that drive um, the adoption of AAC and they drive the um, development of communication for children who are nonverbal. Um, I work with several speech therapists, a few of them in India. Uh, a large number of them in America and a few of them in Denmark as well. And they drive the, 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 the clinical accuracy of the product. They make sure that what we do aligns with clinical research and that it, it aligns with the best practices in therapy worldwide. So that's my team. Thank you. That, that's very interesting. <laughs> We can't hear you, Deborah. Okay, thank you. I muted just in case I'm not, because sometimes I'm very distracting on these calls. So uh, thank you. Um, thank you again for joining us. I know that, um, especially when you join today with our Twitter chat, it's going to be in the middle of the night in India. So uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Uh, the question that I have is I know that the United Nations has done a lot of work to make sure that we're getting assistive technology into the hands of people that need them all over the world. And it's, you know, I'm, it's I know in 2015 that's very, very important to the United Nations and there, there's been a lot of wonderful work done with assistive technology in the United States and in, um, in the United Kingdom and Europe and other places, but uh, we do see a lot of innovation coming out of India and, and other countries and so I was just, um, I, I would like you to talk a little bit about how do we get um, the technology into the hands of everyone that needs it. And before you answer that question, um, I commend you on taking your background and really focusing on social um, enterprises because that's one thing that we're all about on this access chat. We want to make sure that everyone has access to it, all of the big corporations, all of the governments, all the way down to the people though. So it, it, social enterprise is very, very important to who we are. So thank you for being on. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. It means a lot to me that, that you think that way. Um, uh, I, I think it's an interesting question as well. Um, in India, there are... You know, I, 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 I think it's an interesting question. Um, uh, I, I think it's an interesting question. Um, in India, there are a lot of people who are... Computer echoing... Okay, that's clear. That's now. <laughs> um, I think... So I, I've lived in America, and my product is now being sold other countries all over the world. Um, so I, I think it's, it's an interesting question because India does have some characteristics of countries um, 
which perhaps constitute the majority of the world's population, perhaps four-fifths of the world's population, is more like India than like America. And um, this question of how we can introduce um, assistive technology towards the goal of inclusion is actually a very important one. Um, in my interactions with people with disabilities and their caregivers in India and internationally, I think the problem of access to assistive technology is, in my opinion and, and my in my perspective, it's it's actually a less important problem than just access to professional care. Right? What do I mean by that? Um, when I when, when we put out Avas as an app and it was used in in America. Uh, I noticed something very interesting and, and, and a little disturbing. I, I noticed that children at the same level of disability using exactly the same app, Avaaz, um, in India and in America, the kids in America were actually reaching developmental milestones and communication milestones much faster than the kids in India, right? Exactly the same level of disability, the same app. And this was very uh, puzzling to me and in fact a disappointment because we had designed this for India to start with. So when I went to America the first time after we released the app there, I, I actually tried to find some uh, time to meet with the users of, of my product and try to figure out what is causing this imbalance. And within five minutes, I found out, you know, in America, there are 125,000 speech therapists and every AAC intervention is supervised by one of these people. In all of India, a country with a billion people, there are 1,500 speech therapists, 1,500. You know, in the city of Chennai, where I'm from, it's as big as Los Angeles, and that this city has 50 speech therapists. Um, the gap is not a technology gap. I, I think that's the point that um, I, I completely, you know, that, that's that's ingrained in my DNA now. Uh, it's it's a gap which is much more than that. It's a skill gap. It's a care gap. You know, so when when that happened, what we realized, we we struggled with it. Was, it, was an, it was an existential struggle for us. We were trying to build a technology solution in a country which required more than technology. Um, and finally, the answer, at least the, the way that we decided to solve this problem, was to build um, build features into Avaaz that would train a parent on how to think like a therapist. So we were training a parent to be the caregiver of their child. Right. So what a speech therapist learns in a in a five year course, we try to distill that down into a bunch of very practical, very simple tips that any parent could use to to provide that intervention to a child. And so we, we came up with a new app. It's called Avas Together. And that that app does exactly this. And I honestly think that that's the right approach. You know, there's no one who cares for children with speech disability, with any disability really, uh, there's no one who cares for them as much as their parents do. It's just that disability is very intimidating. You know, when 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 you have a child that's diagnosed with disability, um, you feel very vulnerable, very confused. Uh, and, and so many, you know, when you go to the internet and try to look for what, what you can do now that your child has been diagnosed with autism, you'll find a thousand different people saying a thousand different things. But I think if a parent is able to cut through all that, and if we as, 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 uh, as professionals are able to help parents feel more empowered about taking their child's lives into into their hands and taking primary responsibility for that and that's a way that we can reach every single child with a disability anywhere in the world i think that's really interesting because i've, I've worked in the assistive tech industry for a, a long time and we see um how you can deploy assistive tech and yet it not be effective, mainly due to the fact that people don't get the training and care infrastructure around it. So what you observed in terms of the speech and language therapist is also applies across lots of other different assistive technologies. If you don't uh, put the support infrastructure in place, people abandon the technology. So, but that, that's not my next question. My, my next question is actually slightly geeky, um, and, and that is around um, symbol dictionaries. And, and really interested in um, how how we translate different symbols between different nationalities, different languages, and whether or not um, you know your your how do, how do we create interoperability? For if we want a, a web that is free for all, where people who are reliant on these technologies uh, are not cut adrift when say an AAC company goes to the wall because companies do go bust, um, 
how can we how can we enable that? And are you a work, uh, aware of some of the work that that the Mada Center and Qatar are doing? to research into the, the different symbols and they're doing questionnaires and so on around how people interpret different symbols? It's an interesting question. Um, unfortunately, I, I don't have the depth of knowledge to give you a geeky answer to that. I can only share my personal experiences. Sure. Um, there are, so the first, I mean, first of all, the question of do symbols help? Uh, because a lot of people still in, in the autism world primarily still believe that photographs are the way to and more realistic depictions of um, things and people and actions are likely to be more remembered. I actually don't believe that. I think symbols are sometimes easier because um, they're more general, generalizable. So a picture of a dog might only refer to that one dog, where a symbol of a dog could potentially, even though it takes a little more time to be taught, it might, a, a child might have less difficulty relating that to any dog. Um, but um, um, coming back to the world of different symbol sets, there are these different symbol sets. You know, there are three or four really big um, groups around which these symbol sets have, have have, have kind of coalesced the, 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 the commercial ones, like the, the PCS symbols, the symbol sticks, the Pixum symbols, all of these are commercial and, and we actually use symbol sticks, which is one of these. And then there are a bunch of people who are working on free symbol sets. You know, there's the Nouns project, which is, which is a really interesting project. Um, when, I, when, I, when I visited Spain, I found, up, I found out about this really interesting project called the Arasak project, which is a, an initiative for free symbols. I think, um, I think this question is really important. Um, and, you know, um, I, I think the, the, the importance also comes because of the diversity that, that you spoke about. When, when you have people in India that are using symbols, they can relate much better to symbols of the same skin tone and the same kind of clothing and the, same, the kind of food and stuff like that. And that is still a challenge for us. Uh, we've tried to work with some people in India to create those kinds of symbols. But I think the question is really, you know, if, if, every, if, every, if every entrepreneur starts creating their own symbols, then um, it's really hard to get these things um, streamlined and synchronized, not just because you don't, want, you don't want these symbols to be exposed to the child only during AAC. You want it to be exposed to the child across special education. You want it to be used in learning materials. You want it to be used in classroom activities. So um, that's been a question that I've been grappling with as well. Um, so I'm afraid I don't have a very satisfactory answer for you, but that just reflects uh, my own um, ability to try to find a solution for this really important problem uh, and this really important question. Thank you. I don't, I don't think you. anyone has actually resolved the question yet, so uh, you oughtn't feel too guilty. <laughs> But I, I can tell you one other thing that might be interesting to you. Um, we, we often think of words um, as being the building block of language. And that's true in, in a large, in a large, to a large extent because meaning is encoded in words. And so we think of words as being the thing that we need to replace with symbols. Now, while working in India, we had another really peculiar problem to solve. Um, as you may be aware, in India, every state speaks a different language. We have 26 different languages in this country, no, official languages. There are about 1,600 dialects. Now, you know, I, I like to say that people in India are born multilingual. Um, I certainly was. Uh, you know, we, we, we are exposed to three or four different languages, even at a very young age. How can you build AAC systems or accessibility systems that work across different languages? And, and when we try to find a solution to that problem, we found that there was actually a lot more complexity in representing things pictorially than just representing words. Um, you know, and that's, that's, that, that, that's, that's what I, 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 I did a lot of research on to come up with free speech, which I spoke about in my TED talk and all of that. But that's just something interesting that I thought I'd add to that question about symbols. Uh, sometimes it's not just about finding a symbol for a word. It's about finding a pictorial representation for an entire block of meaning or a sentence. Sure. So but uh, did you have the, sa the same issues when you were building the app to support the parents? Uh, um, we did. In fact, in, in India, we, we had this issue where, you know, 
it, it especially because of this this idea that I just mentioned to you that we were trying to empower parents to communicate. And in India, a, a lot of the best special schools have their medium of instruction as English. Uh, but the children who go to these schools, when they go back home, they don't talk in English. They talk in Hindi or Tamil or Telugu or Marathi or any of the other gazillion languages we have in this country. So it's very artificial, you know, when you go back home and you're trying to talk in English to your parents and everybody else in your household is talking in the native language to each other. So it was a very important problem for us to solve. Um, and we, we tried a number of different ways of trying to build these multilingual AAC systems. And I think the way that we finally solved that is to find a way of representing um, an entire sentence and to really do that in a way which doesn't depend on language and build algorithms, build software that converts that meaning representation, that pictorial meaning representation into the language that the child is speaking. So it's almost as if the child is communicating in a language that they know or that's invented for them, like sign language, except that pictures. It's, it's invented for the child. And then we build this computer system that converts that language into the language that the parent understands or that the rest of the world understands. So it's a, it's a, it's a somewhat peculiar way of looking at things. It's almost as though the person with a disability and the person that they're communicating with are speaking different languages. And there's this computer system in the middle that's doing the, the, the translation in some sense. Um, but that seems to be fairly successful uh, in India because it, it eliminates or at least substantially reduces that, that language barrier in the AAC. Uh, this system is called free speech, and I've been working on this for about five or six years now. It's actually a very complicated technology problem, but um, there's light at the end of the tunnel, and some of our early trials have been going really well. So perhaps we'll have a, a, an app for everybody to use. It's in private trials, right? Um, but hopefully we'll have something that everybody can use um, very soon. The world is becoming multi multilingual and multicultural. So it's an important problem for India, but not any less important for the rest of the world either. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Tepper, did you have another question? It looks like we've lost Deborah's internet connection. She'll bounce back shortly. Uh, shortly. I know she's on a satellite phone, so she gets her internet over the satellite. So uh, it's it's not so. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Uh, Pretty advanced. Oh, oh! You can still hear us, so we better not say anything rude. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so one of the things that I, I'm also interested in is, is uh, and we've we've talked about, and Deborah talked about getting. Um, the technology into the hands of the individuals that need it, and that's pricing pricing models. We talked about how expensive things like deck talk are, you know, five thousand dollars a unit and all this kind of stuff. And the app model is is, is different, um, and, and and mobile is different as well. I'm not sure how um, how mobile costs are, are met in um, in India, but in in, in the UK, you, you you have a subsidy for the handset which is paid for over time. And, and I think that um, yeah, what that enables you to do is, you know, it's the computing power in your pocket and also the power of the internet in your pocket. And, and I think that the, the most important thing of all is the, the fact that not only do you have the combination of the affordability, the internet connection, and the um, assistive technology, it's all in one package all together um, and it has enormous reach. So um, what platforms are you, you developing for? Do you, do you see the, the new um, Android, affordable Android phones giving you reach to a greater audience? Absolutely. There's no doubt about that. Um, I think the existence of these smartphones um, it is really what allowed this technology to be a lot more accessible. And certainly that was the bedrock of, uh, on which we built Avaz, you know, the, the availability of technology that, that costs $500 or less. Mm -hmm. um, even that is, is expensive, um, to be sure. I mean, in India, $500 is not a small amount of money. No, uh, no. But, yeah, but the app developers, technology developers, people like me, uh, we're one part of a puzzle, right? I mean, there's several people involved in, in helping ch children with disabilities, people with disabilities. There's uh, people like us who create the technology. There's, the professionals who provide the services, there's funding agencies which 
provide the money. Government, which which regulates all of this, perhaps provides the money in many countries. So we play the role that you know technologists are supposed to play. We create solutions, and uh, we've had a lot of success working with other stakeholders in this equation uh, who have perhaps much more capability to be able to scale these to billions of people. And um, we, we, we've tried working with them to be able to overcome some of these financial hurdles. I think the situation in America was not very different. I mean, you had devices uh, which cost $5,000, $10,000. Now, these are not small amounts of money for an American. Um, you know, it's, it, it, doesn't it, it doesn't matter that it's, it's, it's astronomically expensive for an Indian. But even for an American, $10,000 is, is no laughing matter. And it's just the, the system in America has incredible sensitivity, at least from the perspective of India, it has incredible sensitivity towards people with disabilities. They are given equal access to education, appropriate education, and they're given all of the technology that helps them to do that. And that comes from taxpayers' money. Um, I think we're seeing more and more countries take that enlightened view of disability. Um, the, the idea that just because you have a disability doesn't mean that you should be excluded from education, employment, social interaction. We're seeing more and more of that. Um, but, I, and I think, you know, when, when, when more and more countries develop that sensitivity, we will have a much better, more inclusive world. Um, at that time, you know, during that time, while, while all of that is happening, we will continue to do what we do best, which is to make technologies that make it cheaper and cheaper so that people have less and less excuses to be able to make uh, inclusion available for everybody. Okay. So that's okay. the way we look at it. Uh, I know, I know Deborah asked me to ask another question because she's having difficulty being heard. So um, she was really interested in, in how can you use AAC to help support people with disabilities hold down meaningful jobs and get into uh, into the workforce, and, and also whether or not the technology could be used to to help others that, with different disabilities or even even those without any disabilities. That's a that's a great question and. Um, so this question has two parts. So I'm going to answer each of them separately. Sure. Um, the first is about AAC enabling inclusion. I have a, I have a, I have an opinion um, in uh, in this matter which perhaps is not reflected by many other people in the disability world. I think that the purpose of AAC in some sense is is to make itself obsolete. Um, we we specifically working with children with autism, for example, use AAC as a bridge to literacy. The idea is that children with special needs, children with complex communication needs, um, their inability to access language and communication not just inhibits their ability to communicate socially, but also provides, puts tremendous hurdles on their path to developing reading and writing. I think that the end result of AAC specifically is that a child of any level, it doesn't matter what level of IQ they're at, what their cognitive skills are, what their motor skills are, any child at any level can be taught to read and write. I, I firmly believe that. And I think in today's world, in, in the world of, 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 of 2015, um, the inability to read and write poses a much bigger challenge to inclusion than the inability to speak. And uh, I think that, you know, I, I've worked on that. I, 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 we see um, literacy, uh, the ability to read, to, to read and write as, as being a part of the charter of AAC in some sense. And we've had a very explicit um, dimension in our product research and in our development to help these children develop that skill. I think once you have the ability to read and, read and write, it doesn't matter. I mean, you, you can sit on the other side of, of a computer um, halfway around the world and you can still do incredibly productive work. Uh, you can be a very um, meaningful, valued member of of a of, of a commercial organization or of a team. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't matter, uh, you know, whether you what kind of other disabilities you have. Uh, that's why I think that's key to all of this. I think, the is also yeah, I think that's a really valid point because I am I I do actually work with some people that from time to time um, relapse into um, being nonverbal. Um, and yet they're, they're still incredibly productive because they, they've reached the point where they are you know, very adept at reading and writing. So uh, I, I think you, I, I just wanted to support you in that. I think it's the right approach. Yeah, it, it's controversial. I mean, uh, there are sadly too many professionals, therapists, who think that children 
um, are sometimes too, they, they don't have the skills to read and write. And, and that's tragic. I, I think everybody has the, anyone who can communicate can read and write. It's just, it has to be, it has to be talked to them differently. And that's actually a, an interesting segue into the second question that Deborah asked, which is also very interesting, whether the technologies that we're developing now can be used for people with other disabilities and also for perhaps people without disabilities. And I, I think that's interesting because um, the prevailing view of, of, of developing assistive technology in the engineering community today is to think of it as universal design. So it makes things possible for people who are disabled. It makes things easier for people who are not. Um, I think we all have a language disability in a language we don't know, right? I mean, if you guys came to India, I'm assuming none of you know Hindi. Uh, if, if you came to India, you would be as disabled as someone who couldn't communicate from birth. Um, Definitely. I, I think when we build technologies to, to bridge the communication barrier, uh, we're bridging a barrier which is the heart of our humanness, right? I mean, the ability to communicate for people to talk. We're talking here. You know, I, I'm sitting here in front of the computer talking to three of you in, 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 you know, in, in two different continents. And uh, if, if we can build technology that helps people with disabilities to bridge that gap, uh, this, this technology could be used by anybody to bridge any gap, you know, especially in the work we're doing on language. I think language is a final communication barrier. It's the last barrier that remains in this connected world. Um, my work, you know, in, in, in Walt Disney said this, right? He said that of all of the systems of communication that we have, the most universal is pictures. And of course, that, that proved very commercially lucrative for him. Uh, but I, I think it's true. You know, when we, when we do research in these kinds of technologies and we develop these kinds of, of technologies, it, it can help anyone everywhere in the world. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, we are, no, very, no, we are just about the, the time that we had dedicated for uh, our <laughs> interview and, and show. So um, we look forward to have you uh, uh, today with us uh, on the chat and we really appreciate the time that you had with us and the way how you shared all those insights with you. Uh, I, I, I'm sure Deborah and Neil agree that we could have stayed uh, here for another hour, <laughs> continue to talk about these topics. This was really interesting and because it, it, it bridges a lot of uh, connections and, and uh, there's a lot of uh, interesting things uh, that you have to to, to work in order to make that app successful. So thank you so much for being here with us. And I'm closing the chat now unless thank you very Deborah and Neil want to say something before we go. Deborah? On mute. On. Great interview. <laughs> Sorry, I had technical problems on my end. Um, I'm getting a new uh, service in about 45 days, so I will be much better then. So excellent, excellent interview. Okay. Thank you so much. I will be closing down now. Thank you.